This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today happens to be 102 years old. She is Gladys McGarry. She is a doctor. Her new book, The Well-Lived Life, a 102-year-old doctor's six secrets to health and happiness at every age. This podcast is so much fun. The people I get to talk to, all the different experiences. There is one particular question that I ask Gladys today that I'm sure I will never get a chance to ask anyone else ever again. She's the only person that I will ever know who will have the experience of meeting this individual. Without any further delay, because you don't need any delay, right? You know this lady is very smart. She's 102 years old. She's got all kinds of experience. Let's jump right in with Gladys McGarry. How long did you live in India? I was 15 when I came to college, when I left and came to college. I was born in Fatigar. My parents worked in North India in Uttar Pradesh, Dehradun, Arurki, on up there. And I went to Woodstock School and the Himalayas. That was my childhood until I was 15. Wow, that must have been a culture shock coming back to the States. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's like for me now, when I'm in Vietnam for 10 years, I come back to visit America, and it's a culture shock. I started college, and I knew nothing. I didn't know any of the music. I didn't know any of the people that were important to college-age kids. (laughs) The movies, the Hollywood, all that stuff. No, none of that. But I did know Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret, because they were my stars. Let me ask you to define something. I'm going to make a statement first. The way that you use the term juice, by my observation, I would see in modern times today, less and less people that seem to have figured out what their juice is, or they don't seem to be operating with a juice, or it's not apparent. Can you define juice? I didn't expect that word for what you're describing to come from you. I expected you to use some other word to describe what you're talking about. It's a very kind of modern usage. Can you describe to the audience what juice is from your perspective? And if you want to push back on me in terms of your observations of society today, in terms of the people that you see have either found their juice or have not found their juice. Well, I think the society as a whole is too afraid to even begin to look for it. If you're not looking for something, you never find it. We don't understand that basically we are human beings. The inner core of our humanity is divine. Within us is what I call the physician within each one of us. People They've forgotten that, they've misused the whole idea, shifted into trying to scare people into doing the right, right thing, who can say what the right thing is for anybody, so on. To me, the juice is that inner deep humanity, which E.T. was talking about in Going Home. It's that inner core of us that knows our true humanity is what God created in the first place. And he gave us dominion over the earth. And we thought that meant dominance. We then took over as human beings and we think we're in charge or we could do anything we want to with the animals and the rest of it. That's not at all what dominion means. It means taking care of the idea that within us is something that not only have we forgotten is there, but we don't even tell our children 
about it. We don't even trust the inner urges and callings that our children tell us that they're going through because we don't think that that's important. It's only a dream or something like that. And we put it off. Let me take you back in time and early events that shaped you, that exposed you to your understanding of your juice. I thought it was a fascinating story. I've been around elephants just maybe within five, 10 meters, perhaps at a zoo or something like that. In Thailand, I think I was in an elephant grouping years ago. But you have this experience with an elephant in India, which gave you your understanding of your juice. Why don't you share that story? It's a great story. I was about nine years old, and we were in tents out in the jungles, which is where my parents had taken their medical work to villagers, the poorest of the poor, the poor villagers out in the jungles. That's where we had our tents pitched. We had the medicine tent and all of this. That was my life. One day, my dad took my two older brothers. They went hunting because we were in the jungle and there were the tigers and the leopards and so on. We were attacking village people and that goes on. But they were on a hunt. In the camp was my mother and my sister, who was two years older than me, and my younger brother, who was two years younger. We thought we were helping mother do whatever we could do around the place. And a huge elephant comes walking into camp with his elephant man, the Mahout, the man that takes care of the elephant. The Mahout said to my mother, we were on a hunt. The elephant stepped on a, a broken bamboo stump. He's got a very bad foot. We can't do anything about it. He's having a lot of pain and so on. My mother looked at the Mahout and she said, I haven't ever treated an elephant. Now, my mother is five foot one, okay? And the Mahout said, you're a doctor? She said, yes. He says, all right, you're a doctor. You treat an elephant. She says, all right. The first thing she did was walk over to the elephant, started patting his huge leg and talking to him, just saying nice things, sort of introducing herself to him and finding out what she was trying to find out. Then she went down, felt his foot. She told me to go get a pan of potassium permanganate, which I knew how to fix, and a syringe and a big forceps. I knew what she was talking about. I went and got them, and she took the forceps as she was talking to the elephant, patting him and then reaching down, she reached with the forceps into the wound, found about an eight-inch splinter of the bamboo that was stuck there with a lot of skill and maneuvering. She was able to pull it out. Then she took the syringe and used the potassium permanganate to clean it up, did the things that she could do. She had some soothing ointment that she slapped on the wound and so on. All this time talking to the elephant. And that elephant, I swear, didn't blink. He just stood there and let her do anything she would do to him because I think he felt the love and concern that she had for him. They had a mutual relationship. When she was done, elephant let us kids that put us on his back and we went into the Ganges River and he was getting water and squirting us. We just had a great time. He went home and my mother had asked him to come back the next day. So he did, but he didn't stop at the edge of the camp. The elephant walked straight in to where my mother was, put his trunk around her and lifted her up until she finally patted him and said, now be a good boy and let me down. I have work to do. He did. And then the elephant took us. It was one of those treasured, joyous times in my life. What I learned was at that time, and I didn't know that I learned it at that time, is that all life is connected. If you can just understand that animals understand when they're loved, that Plants understand when they're loved. Mother Earth understands when she's loved and when she's not. All people understand that. 
love is a great healer. The Native Americans know that. They call love the great medicine. It's the strongest medicine ever. That's a great story. I'll share back with you. I think one of the reasons that has kept me in Asia, kept me in Vietnam, but as an American who spent most of his adult life, except for a six-month stretch in the UK, most of his adult life in America, to come to Vietnam and feel this connected peacefulness amongst the people. So in Vietnam today, you can have super rich people, you can have poor people, you can have people in between. There's a connection. When you're on the street or you're anywhere, it doesn't make a difference who you're talking to. For me as an American, I feel something more connected inside Vietnam than I do at the moment when I go to America. If I'm in America, I might be around a group of people and I feel that same feeling as Vietnam, but then maybe I go somewhere else in America and it feels a little rough and ready. So you lose that feeling where there's a consistent feeling in Vietnam that I love. That's why my basic, not only intention, but basic mission at this time is to create a village for living medicine, because I think we need to have a place for just what you're talking about. The people who are there are people who understand that love is the center of that. We will function all of the people who come there because they're looking for that connection based on what I call my five L's. The first one is life. Without life, we have nothing. It's essential. However, life itself can't do anything until it is activated. You have a seed in the pyramid that's been there for 5,000 years, not until somebody picks it up and does something with it, waters it and so on. It can't do anything. It's just there. It has all the energy of the universe within it, but it needs to be activated. It's love that activates life. The first two L's that I think are the linchpin of my philosophy, they make sense to me. Love and life, those two are essentially connected. The third L is laughter. Laughter without love is mean, it's cruel, it's cold. Laughter with love is joy and happiness. The fourth one is labor. Labor without love is drudgery. I mean, you've got to go to work. There are too many diapers, all of this stuff. You're doing it just because you got to do it. Labor with love is bliss. It's why you're in Vietnam. It's why I do the things I do. It's the very energy that activates and continues to activate what it is that we feel we have that we can share. It's that painter that paints, a singer that sings. It's that inner juice that is there, but dormant unless it's connected with love. The fifth one is understanding. Understanding without love is cold, just empty sound, clanging gong. It's nothing. But with love, it's understanding. If we can just tuck that into these five L's, into how we're doing what we're doing, whatever it is that we're doing, for me, it makes it understandable and doable. On my podcast, I've done over 1,100 episodes, probably 700 interviews, probably take five weeks to listening, 24 hours a day to listen to them all. But I feel like I've gotten better at this is actually one of your L's too, the listening part. I've had two guests on my podcast, two economists that were over the age of 90, great interviews, super smart guys. When you look back in time now and you have the chance to observe so many different decades, I think all of us always think the moment that we are in right now is the most special moment. It's the most unique moment. The world is completely different right now while we're alive. You have had the opportunity to observe more time than most people. Share with the audience your perspective on that in the sense that, do you see people changing? Do you see culture changing? Or do you just see different time periods, different events? How do you process when you think about time and all the experiences that you've had? I think that the 
present moment, no matter when it is, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, that was the most important moment. Right now is the most important moment because we can't change what we did 20 years ago, but we can change the trajectory that we're going in now if we feel that it's in the wrong direction. This is the moment in which and through which we either accept our life force and work with it or say, well, it's enough, I'm done. And that can happen. If it does, then it happens. Life has to move. If life isn't reaching for something, it dies. And that reaching for something is what I call the juice. It's that knowing that there's a light, and we may not see it right now, but it's at least maybe having a little flashlight in our hand and walking down our path of life. We can just see as far as that flashlight lets us go. But we take one step and we take one step and we take one. Those steps are the most important ever. We have to understand that this moment that you and I are talking is the most important moment in my life. When I started school, I was so dyslexic. I couldn't read. I couldn't write. I had to repeat first grade. It was really hard. I had to live through that time and understand that something within me was there still. I was a class dummy and got good at fighting and so on. But when I was in third grade, my teacher saw something in me. She appointed me class governor. She saw that I could work with people. I could talk. I was talking all the time. I could do things that would connect other people. I became the one who would present to the whole student body what our third grade group was doing. That was a turning point for me. Just about that same time, I realized I woke up one morning and I was sat up in bed and I said, I don't have any friends. And I thought, why don't you have any friends? And I thought, well, you're always fighting. You think you have to fight for everything. You don't have any friends. And I thought to myself, well, who do you know that has friends? I thought it was my mother. I realized that my mother had the blessed way of taking anything that came along and with just a little turn, she could get humor out of it. It was a genius thing. Everybody loved her. She was that kind of a person. And I thought, maybe instead of fighting and looking for all this to fight about, maybe you could try to do what your mother does and start to look for things that are funny that can turn your life around. And about that time, my teacher gave me the opportunity to do a class play, which is the frog jumped over the pool. Okay. Now I'm nine years old. I'm bigger than the other kids because I've been held back a year. I can jump over this pan of water. And so that was my job. In front of the whole student body, I walked confidently onto the stage. As I looked, though, I saw my two older brothers out in the audience, and it threw me off my pace. So instead of jumping over the pond, I landed in it, and the whole student body just started laughing. My suit started fading. I sat down in the tub, and I started to cry. The teacher had to come and get me off the stage. There I was a total disaster. When I got home at the dinner table, my brothers are telling the story to everybody. My mother says, all right, boys, you've had your fun now. What can we as a family do to help Gladdy understand that there are ways to have people laugh with her and not against her or not at her? Whatever they did, I don't know. remember what it did, that has helped me because there has been time after time that something has happened. I've tripped going up to the podium or something. I've always been able to pick it up, start out with humor. It's a way of looking at life. I had the blessing of having a mother that understood that.
I took it on and I've been running with that ever since. I've had a chance to observe a lot of different people in my life. I had a chance to observe my grandmother. She lived to age 100. I had a chance to observe my great grandmother. She lived to age 101. I had a chance to observe my other grandmother. She lived to age 94. I'm not saying anything negative about these ladies. They're all great ladies. But I can immediately tell when I have a conversation with you, I'm not thinking about your age. I'm just having a conversation with you. Now, it's quite interesting. Your age is interesting, but we're just having a conversation. I can also find myself talking to somebody who's age 30 today or age 50 or age 60. I don't have this same conversation or this same type of engagement. I guess what I'm putting on the table to you, why do you have this consistent engagement, this consistent work ethic? I have a feeling you don't just sit down and watch soap operas all day long. You are an engaged lady who's working and making stuff that you want to do happen. Why do you have this? I want you to explain your process some. Because when I get up in the morning and I have my special prayer, I realize that the sun came up and I'm still here. And if I'm still here, I've got work to do. And it may just be cleaning up the kitchen today. I didn't get it done or whatever it is. There's something that needs to be done. Lo and behold, something turns up. I have an opportunity to talk to you. I would never, when I was 90, never have thought that I'd be talking to somebody in Asia about a book that I have written at this stage of my life. It's just the reality that there's always something, it may not be anything big, but it's something that I got to do today. Someone I need to call, something needs to be done. It seems like that's what you, in many ways, are trying to get across to people, is to find that something inside you that drives each individual to keep trying to find these experiences every day. People are so afraid right now. They're so confused and befuddled because there's so many different things that are absolutely right or absolutely wrong, but they don't know what they feel within themselves is right or wrong. It's the whole, what I call the physician within. My eldest son is a retired orthopedic surgeon. When he'd finished all of his training, he came through Phoenix. He said, Mom, I'm going into the world because he was just ready to start his practice in Del Rio, Texas. He said, I'm going to have people's lives in my hands. I don't think I can handle that. And I said, well, Carl, if you think you're the one that does the healing, you have not something to be afraid of. If you can understand that it's your job to do what you've been trained to do, which is amazing work. Orthopedic surgery is terrific. People need it. You do your work with love and caring. Then you support the patient while the physician within them does the actual healing. Your responsibility is to support that colleague, that physician within the patient that does the healing. If we can recognize within each other, like you said before, that sometimes you see the connection with people. If you can recognize that and then build on that, life just goes on. When you mention the physician within, I guess another way at that moment to describe that would be that positive attitude. Whereas many people might look at, I'm sure you have some perspectives on the current American medical establishment system, the way that people participate. When you talk about the physician within, if people are not imagining this, where you're really going towards is, hey, hold on, everybody. It's not just about being overweight and taking drugs to fix the overweight part. It's not just about getting surgery because of some other th environmental issue that you didn't take care of. What you're really saying with physician within is getting people to really understand the power of the mind on our physical well-being as well. Our body-mind connection is vital. Yesterday, a friend of mine had a funeral service for her on Easter Sunday. Amazing thing, she was 79 years old. 
But she had lived since she was 18 months old with one quarter of one kidney. Now, none of us physicians ever figured out how she did that. She lived 76 years with that one quarter of one kidney because she knew what she could do and what her body could handle and what it couldn't. If her inner knowledge was that that's not good for me, there wasn't any physician who would tell her it was. There were enough of us physicians around who knew her and loved her and understood her. When she was sick, we'd say, okay, now here's what we would do. What would you do? And then she would take whatever it is that we would do, lace it into whatever it was that she could handle. She would do it. I worked with her for at least 60 years. Watch this woman living her life completely with honesty and integrity, loving her body enough, loving herself enough that she trusted that inner within. These are people who I call people who live with living medicine. They understand the reality of what happens when you really pay attention to what your inner being knows is right for you. Because, you know, I like onions, but my son, oh, can't stand them. If I try to tell my son he should eat more onions, it wouldn't go very far. You are, in terms of your physical practice, Pilates some still? Not anymore now. I walk with a walker. I'm not as steady. My eyesight isn't as good. Things happen. I have a tricycle that I ride. The two back wheels are like my body mind and the front wheel is my spirit. But then it can't go any place until I get into it. And that's the physician within. We could go around my yard. My mother called it make do. You do what you do and then you make do. It sounds so simple. A lot of people could hear you say that. And they're going to have this excuse, and that excuse, and I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah. It doesn't seem important until you really begin to look at the importance of the choices that we make. Those choices that we make are essential to what our life is going to be, how we're going to live. People can start feeling blame and all of that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the reality of loving yourself enough that this person that you are is a really good person and you love that person. My oldest daughter, she had a lecture that she used to do, My Body, My Beloved. It's the reality that we could do a lot of work with a lot of things. Every moment of every day, we work with this body. I am, let's see, 11 years into my serious yoga here in Asia. I can't do without it. And even though you're looking at this big guy on the screen, this big guy on the screen can still do the full splits. I love it. I love it. I completely love it. You talked earlier about the moment of now. I've seen in your writings where you talk about you don't want people to get in this mindset of conserving energy. Perhaps they're conserving energy for retirement in the future. But I love the way that you get people to break that paradigm instead of just waiting, 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 conserving, conserving. Maybe I'll get to retirement I love the way that you reframe it to the moment of now, because when you reframe it to the moment of now, it opens up endless possibilities right now, right now. Right, right. We misunderstand when a doctor says, when I say to a patient, now you need to really rest with this. You need to go home and rest. So often what the patient feels is that I'm saying, you need to go home and just do Nothing? That's not what I'm saying. To rest is to do something. It's you are going to go home and take a rest or do something about what needs to be done. The intention of taking a rest is to do what your body needs at that time. But it's not saying, oh, 
I give up. I can save my energy by taking a rest. You're using your energy properly in taking the rest in a proper way. To use your energy in a way that keeps it alive and you know it's alive and you're using it actively instead of thinking you're banking it or you're saving it for some other great thing that might happen. It doesn't work that way. You use it now and you use it the way you can use it now. Then you can take a rest and then you can actually understand that everything that you do is doing, if that's your intention. I should share with you, when I first came to Asia, I was on a speaking tour, 20 large cities, 10 countries. The moment I was in Vietnam, I thought to myself, I'm not leaving, I'm staying here. It's very unusual. Okay, I had the ability to make that choice. I've met a lot of young people with far less economics, and they make the same choice. I've seen people at all different stations of life. I've seen the mega wealthy, I've seen backpackers. When people feel it, they can make the decision, and there's no excuse. But I think sometimes people don't want to admit that they're feeling it. They don't want to admit that they're feeling it. Well, they've never been told that it's a good thing to do. They're told to save their energy, save their money, save this and save that. If you're thinking that your future is dependent on what you have laid up for future use, it doesn't even work when you get in the future because you've gone past that stage. You haven't used what you had at the time. You didn't make do like my mother says. I had a friend here in his 30s I was already living in Vietnam and he would come through and he was traveling around Asia, a little bit of a backpacker mindset, digital worker. He really loved Vietnam. And I kept telling him, I was like, well, why don't you just make the decision? You love it here. Why don't you just stay? He just couldn't make the decision. And I kept telling him, I was like, I know what's going to happen. You're going to end up here. So why don't you just make the decision now? He's like, no, no, no. I got to travel. I got to travel. About four or five years later, he made the decision. Now he's here. Now he's married to a Vietnamese lady. <laughs> <laughs> he was going the direction. Let me ask you to contrast. This is a big question. It's a big statement that I'm going to lay out. For people that want to understand your holistic thinking when it comes to medicine, and you've already been doing it in this conversation, getting people to understand all your different perspectives. But if you were to contrast some of your Eastern thinking, your Eastern understandings to the Western understandings when it comes to medicine, where would you start to share some of your insights? Of course, we want people to read your book and check your book out a lot more detail there, but where would you start to bring people into your understanding of both worlds? I would start with what we started with when we started the American Holistic Medical Association. What we did then, this was in the late 50s and the early 60s, we recognized that medicine knew a lot about the body was beginning to learn about the mind, but had no idea about the spirit. Holistic medicine, it took us two years to decide how to spell holistic because we finally realized the word we were looking for was health, healing, and holy. We needed the H in that word to get holistic spelled properly. Anyway, the idea was getting the spirit into the practice of medicine, which meant, of course, love and the caring that goes with it, that was essential when we started the American Holistic Medical Association. Incidentally, coincidentally, one time there were 10 of us doctors sitting around the table. Of the 10 of us, six of us were severely dyslexic. We finally looked at each other and we said, well, maybe because we had to learn to read differently and none of us know well, I don't know how I learned to read. I just learned to finally did. We had to find another way of doing it. The other way of doing it was to bring this whole light of the spirit into it. That's why I was in the grocery store here about 15 years ago. I heard a hardware store down the street announcing itself as a holistic hardware store. So I stopped my carriage and I said, well, we've done it. Now we get to move to the other word. That's living medicine. 
the word that I'm using now is living medicine because it's the activation of the life force within each one of us that does the healing. That is love. What I'm really wanting to do is have a village for living medicine where we can do this kind of thing like I was talking about before. That village, though, I guess, maybe I'm living in one of those villages right now, so to speak. When I first came to Vietnam, and maybe you've got an experience similar in India, I don't speak the language. I still don't speak the language, except a very small amount. The interest and the curiosity and the compassion and the caring that all these people that don't know me have for me, also, especially considering I'm American in Vietnam, there's some history there. It's quite amazing. I try to tell people, friends, I mean, my parents have visited multiple times. Some friends have visited. I think people, when I tell them, I try to explain some of these experiences, maybe very similar to how you're explaining some of the experiences that you are saying on this podcast. I don't know. Maybe people think I'm a little crazy or something. Maybe they just can't register it. Sometimes you just have to go and see it because you can't necessarily imagine it. I can imagine because your great story with the elephant and I'm in Asia and I've been around some elephants, some, I can imagine the story. I want to put myself right there and be there when you were a little girl to observe it. It would be something even more different to be there at the moment. That inner knowing that you have, a village for living medicine can happen any place. I have a friend who moved to Mexico. Her village there is really a village for living medicine. The way they have come together, she's become the grandmother for the village. So when we say a village for living medicine, I am looking for a specific place where I can create one that I envision. That doesn't mean that people all over the place can't create villages for living medicine where life itself is the essence of what we're working with. That's what we're there for. Do you have any fear? Oh, yeah. What do you have to be afraid of? When I built this house, I built my upstairs, but I have a stairway that I could very easily trip and fall. I don't see too well and this, that, and the other thing. I have to be very, very careful. I ask the angels to help me because there are things that I do. It's dangerous going up and down these steps, and I do it repeatedly during the day. There are other things like that. That's a physical fear. What about inside the mind? I've been called witch doctors, and when I was in medical school, the dean sent me to the psychiatrist twice, and the psychiatrist sent me back and said, material that worked with okay for medicine, but I've been misunderstood so many times that it's really kind of funny. I take it that way. They just don't understand. What's the biggest thing over the course of your life that people have not understood? Maybe that's too big of a question. You can start me down the path. No, it's not too big. They don't understand. They think it's woo-woo. When I say, pay attention to the position within you, oh, ha-ha. Ooh, and uh, witch doctor person, holistic medicine, ha ha, ha ha. Yeah, but now there was the hardware store <laughs> that got it. I mean, there's so much humor in the world all around that if you can find it, it really makes it not just more doable, but more fun. I'll share something with you. I told you earlier, I've been doing yoga for a long time. The thing that I love about yoga I still can't say that I'm great at meditation or great at breath work. What I am good at is being consistent to practice. I do it because the feeling that it leaves me with afterwards, I'm not drinking, I'm not taking drugs, but it's like that feeling afterwards is like, wow, where did it come from? It's so amazing. I want to share with you also what's really interesting. You talk about the frou-frou that if I tell people I do yoga, Okay, I'm a good sized guy. A lot of people think, oh, well, whatever, yoga. But here's the funny thing. Now I see on all the social media channels that a lot of very in shape men, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, they're all doing yoga, okay? They're all showing off yoga exercises. But here's what they've done. 
they've changed it. They don't call it yoga. They call it mobility exercises. <laughs> so they, they, they don't want anyone to know they're doing yoga. Me and the yoga teachers here in Vietnam, I'll share the videos. And it's like, look, they are afraid to call it yoga, but that's all they're doing are yoga exercises. Yeah. It's quite funny because they're so afraid of the frou-frou that you talk about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One final question for you, because I don't think I'll probably get a chance to ask this question on this podcast again. But in your youth, you had a chance to meet a quite interesting, I believe you met him or close proximity to meet a quite interesting leader in India, Gandhi, right? Yes, yes, definitely. My parents worked with Gandhi during the partition. When India was torn apart, the Hindus and Mohammedans killing each other, my parents did medical work in the camps and so on. My dad would share a platform with Gandhi. There was a working relationship. I was in college. I didn't participate in that, but my brother did because he was a physician. Could But I was doing my work here. I was 10 years old and we were leaving India for a furlough in the United States and we were on the train. The train was slowing down and stopping and I had my face plastered against the window looking out of the compartment because there was a whole crowd of people going, following one man, and it was Gandhi. As I was watching him go, he reached down and took a flower from a little child who was reaching up to him. I made eye contact with him across the way as a 10-year-old I felt it. It's what you're talking about, what I'm talking about, that connection. Then later, my parents worked with him. I knew what it was that they were working together with as Gandhi was doing his best to bring his country, bring the love, and work with the people who were so damaged and so hurt, all of that. And that's what my parents were doing, too. So they had great friendship. I have a shawl that Mahatma Gandhi gave my mother, and it's in my closet here. He gave my dad a punny putty blanket. It was that nice, ongoing relationship. What a great story. A great place to end our conversation today. Gladys, I thank you for giving me your time. I hope you enjoyed my questions bouncing you around. I love thinking about you in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> I love being here. <laughs> I'm sure you have a very good sense of, based on how I've described things, why I love it. There's just something. I'm not even sure that if somebody comes here for two weeks as a traveler, as a tourist, they would even experience what I've experienced. I tell people, hey, forget the two weeks stuff. Just come for six months. Come for a year. I afraid sometimes the two week traveling stuff, people run around and party. They don't even see behind the curtain. That's what I always implore people. You're living it. You don't get over stuff. You live it. And if you live it, it's living medicine. That's what you're doing. You have created that. If people want to get in touch with me, that is McGarry.com. For the book, I want people to check your book out. And it's The Well-Lived Life, a 102-year-old doctor's secrets to health and happiness at every age. We've only just touched on so many of the points that you make. I implore people to check your book out. That's probably the first step. You're easily found online, like you said, if they want to reach out to you. We'll put your contact information in the show notes. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's been fun. Yes, absolutely. Now, hold on. 102. When's your birthday? What month? Well, my birthday is November. I'm 102, but it's 102 and a little more than half. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, best of luck. Hopefully in the future, when you have another new book, we can talk again. Thank you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. 
To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.